okay, so if these teachers who I'm working with right now were students in my classroom, what would I need to ask and know about them in order to better serve them? So like sometimes we think like, oh, they're professionals and like we need to, they need to do this, that and the other thing because they're the professionals, but they're humans. And like, what do they need as people uh, to be successful? Welcome back to this edition of Leading Through Unprecedented Times. I'm Tom Murray, your host, and I am so excited for this episode with two of my good friends, two incredible educational leaders, and I'm excited about the topic we are going to have today. So I want to welcome Ross Cooper and Aaron Murphy. My friends, how are we doing? Welcome to the Future Ready Podcast. Aaron, how are you? What's going on? What's new with you? And then over to Ross. Hey, Tom. Um, things are going well. Um, we are making things work over here in Allentown, Pennsylvania. So uh, no complaints. <laughs> awesome. And Ross, how about for you? Yes. Same here. Uh, we have the, uh, week off thankfully, which is nice. And, uh, we're looking on, uh, we're looking at turning the corner and hopefully, um, we're thinking next year in our uh, school district in Westchester, things will look a whole lot more normal, which is a great thing. Absolutely. Well, let's dive into the the whole pandemic. Here we are talking on the leading through unprecedented times. One of the things that I really respect about your work is the human side of it and really respecting the teacher, the student, and not losing sight of the human piece to all of the work. Aaron, I want to start with you. Like right now in the midst of a pandemic, fear and anxiety are just so high. Talk to us about what you're seeing and really ways that we can keep, whether it's the student or even the teacher, the human side, the human connection. When we talk about instruction because the conversation I want to have you with you guys, you're two gurus and around project-based learning. And I want to start to dive into that. But to me, it really begins with that human connection. So Aaron, talk to us a little about that if you could. Yeah, I think that one of the, one of the things that has always drawn me to the project-based approach or the inquiry-based approach, or just this concept of like student-driven instructional practices is that it is really guided by getting to know your, your students, getting to know the kids that we are working with. Um, so because of an effective project, an effective unit is really driven by whether or not your kids buy in and whether it's something that they're interested in and, um, and whether or not it's something that's going to like sort of speak to them as people and not just as students. And, you know, That is, it's so interesting that you started by saying like, how does this apply to to teachers? Because I I didn't think about this early on in my times as an administrator, but now more and more I think about like, okay, so if these teachers who I'm working with right now were students in my classroom, what would I need to ask and know about them in order to better serve them? So like, sometimes we think like, oh, they're professionals and like, we need to, they need to do this, that, and the other thing because they're the professionals, but they're humans and like, what do they need as people uh, to be successful? So I really like the way you frame that question. Thanks. And one of the things, you know, when we're looking at the pandemic and, and here we are recording in the spring, obviously we've been through this pandemic for over a year now, people are really starting to vision the fall and we keep hearing, you know, we don't want to go back to the way things were that new normal idea. What should it look like? What should we hold on to? What should we change? And both of you have been such advocates around project-based learning and just really re, re, uh, redesigning the instructional experience for students. So Ross, when you talk about project-based learning, what is that look like? Maybe I'm a teacher in a classroom listening to this and I'm like, well, I I do projects. Is this a, is this a book report project? And I check it off. Or maybe I'm a principal being like, what, what does this really look like? Talk to us if you would big, big picture. When you guys talk about project-based learning, what's the type of experience that you're really talking about? Yeah. So a lot of times when we talk about project-based learning or a project or a PBL experience, we contrast it with the uh, traditional projects um, that a lot of us used to do uh, when, when we were students, but also these traditional projects, they're, they're, that's how we shouldn't hate on them, right? Because that's how all of us got our foot in the door with project-based learning. So it's this idea that everybody's learning is in a different place. And it's very easy to look at these more quote unquote, like traditional projects and, and hate on them and say, oh, you shouldn't be doing that. So whether, no matter what it is, whether it's reading workshop, writing workshop, technology integration, project-based learning, 
everybody's learning is in a different place on the continuum. So we look at that as like a starting point, there's more traditional projects, they're a starting point into project-based learning. And when you look at the more traditional projects, generally um, it's, you know, you do all the learning, right? Maybe you have the test, maybe you have a quiz. And now that you've done your learning, it's like, okay, now let's do something cool with it. You know, it's kind of looked at as um, almost as a dessert, they call it, right? Whereas uh, with project-based learning, you're learning through the project itself. So rather than it being the dessert, um, it's more of the main course. So what would happen is rather than doing all the learning and saying, now that you've done all that learning, hey, guess what? Surprise, surprise, let's do something cool with it. It's over the next four, six, eight weeks, this is the challenge that we're gonna tackle or you're gonna find the challenge that you wanna tackle that's relevant to you. And all of the mini lessons, all the extended lessons, all the activities and performance tests that we uh, that we engage in over the next four, six, eight weeks, whatever it might be, are gonna be done within the context um, of that bigger project-based learning experience. And because it's done within the context of that experience, um, the learning is that much more uh, purposeful and relevant to the learner. Yeah. And I want to dive into some of those key components of project-based learning that I'm guessing many people have questions on, but to me, it also has to start around culture. You know, at Future Ready, we focus so much on leadership and school culture, it's the outside of the Future Ready framework. And when we think about it, like, let's face it, a culture where people can take risks, a culture of fail, failing forward um, really needs to be in place for this type of learning to occur, whether it's the teacher creating that culture in a classroom, principal at the building level, you've both served as principals, you've both served at the district level. So Aaron, back to you. Talk to us about the type of culture that people need to create and ways to do it. So something like project-based learning, the shift in pedagogy really can occur. Yeah. So I, I don't mean to be redundant, but I honestly think that this kind of like goes back to where we started, where if you want kids to feel safe taking risks and trying something uh, with a project or in your classroom, they have to know that you know them as a person, right? And they have to trust you as a person too. Um, that, you know, it, it can't be a situation where it's like, it's okay to take risks. And just because you made that pl proclamation that suddenly people feel like that's fine, right? Like the kid needs to know like, okay, so she knows that I really like to play soccer and she knows that um, my mom's sick. And she, like, you know, the, this child needs to know that you know them as a person. Um, and that is really what's going to allow kids to feel comfortable taking risks, feel safe in your space. Um, in, ed, in ed theory, they talk, there's this concept of funds of knowledge, which is where like kids and families bring their culture and um, concepts of their home. And those things then drive what happens in the classroom. And when we get to that point where kids feel comfortable sharing pieces of themselves with us so that we can then use that as part of the instructional process. That's when real, um, what I would say, constructive risk-taking is going to take place. Um, we need to know them as people first. Russ, and as, a, as being an elementary principal right now, how would you go about, maybe I'm a principal like you listening to this, how do you go about encouraging teachers to shift that? Because let's face it, our, our brain isn't wired to take risks and try new things. We resort to safety. We want to do a good job. Here comes that observation. So we resort to what we're comfortable with, what we know. How do we create that culture, Ross, where teachers are willing to take those next steps? Yeah. So first thing, um, elementary assistant principal right now. <laughs> Just, just, just anyway, gotcha. just throwing that out there. So anyway, um, I, I think it has to be systemic, you know, and we've talked, I know we've all talked about this before, this idea that um, if you're going to, if you're going to like, the, the example I always give is like an organization that says, oh, we want to move forward. We claim an innovation. We want people to take risks. But but when the teachers walk through the door, you better sign in on time or you better sign out or, you know, like little things, like little things like that. Um, you know, like those little like things, those little gotchas or those little, you know, the, and, and to me, it really has to be, um, you know, you, you have your mission, you have your vision, you have your learning beliefs and everything should be geared in that direction. Right. So if you're, if you're telling your students, Hey, I want to empower you. Um, I want you to have voice and I want you to have choice, um, and, and agency over your learning. Right then that's something that should exist for teachers. That is something that should exist for building level administration. That's something that ex should exist um, for administration and central office or the ed center or whatever you want to call it. I, and I think, I think um, 
And, and I think it's something we need to look at critically. You know, we need to make sure we need to have those hard conversations sometimes ab about that alignment, um, what it looks like, whether it does or does not exist within our organization. A and if it, you know, and, and how we could continue to move it in that direction. Um, because, you know, if, if I'm saying to my teachers, I want you to empower your students, um, but, you know, I have teachers walking through the door every day, especially in the middle of a pandemic saying, you know, I don't feel seen, I don't feel heard, I feel invisible. Um, you know, what kind of message does that send, right? What kind of message, that, message does that send? So ideally, we want these beliefs of ours to be systemic. Yeah, you know, you're reminding me, Ross, I remember being a senior in college, sitting in a class right before my student teaching, and it was a three-hour class, three-hour lecture on engagement, Right. And I turn and think like, how many times do we as professional learning, like herd people into cattle, into large group rooms, talk at them for hours at a time and call it professional learning. And then on the next comments, we're talking about voice and choice. And yet how often do we give that to teachers? And one thing I can say is I know the greatest districts out there, we, that's exactly what they're doing, treating teachers like professionals. And yes, it doesn't mean that yes, sometimes if there's new science standards, you've got to do it. doesn't matter if you want to do it. You're a science teacher, you need to do it. But there's other times where but we've got to get that voice and that choice for them. Otherwise we can't really do it for students. And, and it's easy to say one thing and yet often model another. And so let's dive a little bit further into that voice, that choice from a student. And Aaron, what does that look like? Maybe, you know, you get, you're supervising high school teachers right now as well. And part of your role, like if, if I'm that, that teacher at the high school level, listening to this, or even that principal, what is voice and choice agency? We use those terms a lot. What does it actually look like? So I think that I love, okay. So I really like this question because the nitty gritty, I think is what really ends up becoming the barrier between these things happening and not happening. And I think that one of the biggest shifts that needs to occur to ensure students voices um, are heard and seen in a classroom is um, moving away from the whole group approach. And I know that that seems simple, but ensuring that there are times that kids are um, like working with a teacher one-on-one -on -one opportunities, whether they are conferencing about a book that they've read, or if they are in a small group, maybe you, you mentioned high school English. So like maybe they're doing a literature circle, something where they are having some kind of small group or individualized dialogue. That's when you're going to learn about your students. And I think a lot of times when we talk about voice and choice, we think like, oh, I'm going to send out a survey and decide which book kids want to read. Or, oh, I'm going to let kids decide whether they want to do this project, predetermined project, or this predetermined project. Like, um, and student voice goes so much further than just having an opinion between whether they want to make a poster board or they want to make a diorama. Like they have, they come to us, especially our secondary students, they got opinions. And if we continue to instruct void of their opinion, um, then our instruction is void. Uh, so I think the more that we create the opportunities to talk to them or talk, I, I shouldn't have said to them. What I meant to say was talk with them. Um, I think the, that's how we're going to learn about them. And then we're going to come to value that input that they bring to the table. Yeah. Ross, that's an area I know you talk a lot about as well. Is there anything you want to add there? Yeah. I mean, what, what we say is, you know, um, student choice needs to be more than letting students decide where they're going to copy and paste their work. Right. And that, that's really what Aaron's getting to. It's like, all right, now that you've done all this work that I've asked you to do, um, you know, you could, you could put it wherever you want. So, so some students did it as a poster board. Some students did it as a, <laughs> let's go with a diorama, a Prezi, uh, what's hot now, Jamboard, a Flipgrid, you know, everybody has Flipgrid fever and I like Flipgrid, but it, it's like why, I think it's thinking critically about what we want to accomplish or what the students want to accomplish. And, and so why are you using that medium? So sometimes like we hate on poster boards or if I'm working in elementary school, I'm trying to make a difference around my school hanging up poster boards could be very effective with maybe QR codes based on what, um, based on what I want to accomplish. And I think um, one of the activities that we've done with educators is, is undoubtedly you do get, and we're guilty of this as well, a lot of teachers and educators who say, oh, my students have voice, my students have choice. And um, th through different activities that we've done through professional learning, um, it, it's almost like a student choice audit 
you know, take a project that you've done, take an activity that you've done, make a teacher on one side, put teacher choice on one side, put student choice and just map out all the choices that took place throughout this activity. And undoubtedly, when we do that, you have teachers mumble to themselves, wow, like my, my students really don't have a say mm -hmm. during this activity or even in, in my classroom as a whole. And, and what's, what's great about activities like that is you, rather than um, talking at somebody and saying, you know, forget everything you've done over the past six, eight, whatever months or years, like that was wrong, this is right. It, it's it's your modeling inquiry, right? You're modeling inquiry, you're modeling, you're modeling the type of learning we want to see taking place in classrooms. And teachers on their own are uncovering, or educators on their own are uncovering, hey, there just might be a better way to do this, you know? And so that, that activity helps to facilitate that. And then it's like, all right, now how could you take some of the choices that are on the student choice, I'm sorry, that, that are on the teacher choice side of the T-chart and intentionally move them over um, to, to teacher choice. So you guys, you, you didn't know I was going to do this, but because I knew I had you on the podcast, I actually went ahead and got a early released copy. Congratulations, oh. you're in order, because if you're watching the podcast, they're not just administrators in school districts, <laughs> they're also authors. And I'm fascinated by this topic as a former teacher, as a former principal. So congratulations on project-based learning, real questions, real answers, how to unpack PBL and inquiry. And what I love about it is as I'm firing away some of these questions, as I started to, to read this recently, taking a look at the different chapters and really asking a lot of these essential questions. Questions. So I'm going to throw through a few of these questions at you. And if you're listening to the podcast and can't see the book that I just raised, you know, chapter two, and how did I get, how do I get grades? How do I conference with students? What about direct instruction? How do I build a PBL culture? How do I manage the chaos? What about the inquiry side? How do I get started? So I'm going to give you an opportunity to answer some of those questions pretty quickly if we could, because to me, they really get the essence of like the yeah, buts, right? Like, uh -huh. yeah, but like, we've got to give grades in my school. School. Like, yeah, but like we the kids need direct instruction, you know? Yeah, but and so you hit these head on and I love the format of that and I do it. So I want to bring up one that I haven't talked about since. Let's talk about managing the chaos, right? <laughs> so when we think about I even put my principal hat back on or put my teacher hat back on, you know, sometimes we feel like if my principal is going to walk in my room, it's got to be orderly. Kids have to be quiet. It looks it has to look like learning's actually happening. And let's face it. That's not the case. So I love the idea around managing the chaos. Aaron, let's start with you. Like, talk to us about what that looks like. If I'm a principal and I walk into a PBL classroom, like what, what might it look like? What's learning? Talk to us about that. Yeah. So I think that probably the most important thing that happens to manage the chaos is creating routines. And when we say create routines, I think that initially we go to compliance, like, okay, well, the routine is going to be that you have to put your poster board back in this spot and you have to put the scissors back where this belongs. And um, it really comes down to like almost just, they're just rules. And that's not necessarily the kind of effective routines that uh, we're getting at. The most effective routines are routines that are driven by student needs. Because uh, as human beings, what do we create? What do we create routines for, right? So we create routines so that I get to work on time and like I can ensure that I get my cup of coffee before I get to work on time because that's what I need. Um, so we need to make sure that it's driven by what the kids need. So we really, really believe in creating the routines with the students. Like they're not necessarily just something that a teacher teaches the kids. It's something that emerges from a student need. So we're going to need to make sure that everybody has supplies or, or actually better yet, guys, tell me when you've done projects in the past, what have been some of the biggest problems? Oh, I can't find the supplies that I need, or I can't get a question answered when I want it answered. So then we develop routines around what the kids feel like they're going to need from us. Like, okay, so how do we make sure that everybody can get the supplies that they need? What is a process that we can put in place to make sure that that happens? And then we practice it, right? So there needs to be modeling. Um, so that's sort of what, before you start the project or during the project, you also need to be ready to pause and say like, oh no, this problem just emerged. Let's come to the carpet. Let's, well, now when we can come to the carpet, but <laughs> let's talk about how we should solve this problem. Maybe we need to develop a new routine. Maybe we need to develop a new structure for this. 
Um, so doing it with the students so that they understand the why behind why they're doing it, because it's really easy to break rules. But if you understand, like, if you understand why I'm doing it, I'm doing it so that the person next to me can have scissors when they need scissors. Uh, that's different than I'm putting this away because Mrs. Murphy told me to. Yeah. Ross, I want you to answer the one on assessment and grading. Like, here's the yeah, but we've got to give grades here. We have a report card. Can't be a free for all. How do you address that? Yeah. So we're going to we'll try to do this without getting too geeky, but um, because we could go on and on. I mean, about like learning targets and, and, and success criteria and things like that. Um, I, I think so. I'll give, I'll give a couple main points. And I think one is that you hear a lot of talk about um, gradeless classrooms nowadays, or this idea of feedback in lieu of grades. And um, I think one of the quotes we gave was like the Pablo Picasso quote that said um, something like, learn the rules, you know, basically you have to learn the rules before you break them. I can't remember the exact quote, but it's like, learn the rules before you break them. And then I think that a solid understanding of standards-based grading is so important. And it's almost like a prerequisite before going gradeless. It's like, you have to know the rules of what solid grading practices look like before you go gradeless. And I think um, based on my experience, a lot of schools and districts don't prioritize that when it comes to professional learning, because it, it's not all that fancy, let's face it. you know. Um, so I would recommend whether it's through your district or, or on your own, you know, educating yourself as to what solid standards-based grading practices look like. I, I think that's number one. And then during project-based learning, um, because students are involved in a great deal of inquiry and creativity, we know that based on the research by Daniel Pink, based on the research from Alfie Cohn, um, that what happens is when you when you throw a grade at creativity, you're going to squash it, right? Mm -hmm. If we want people to think in a creative way and we say, but this is going to be graded, it's going to serve as an obstacle to creativity. So you want to drown out that grading as much as possible in lieu of feedback without grades. Because if you give feedback in a grade, what, what do students do? They look at the grade first, then they look at the grades of their classmates, and then they ignore their grades, right? And they throw, they throw out the feedback. So really, as much as possible, I would say, learn what solid standards-based grading practices look like. Uh, when students are engaged in project-based learning, uh, feedback as much as possible in the absence of grades. Um, and then you have that couples, uh, you would couple that feedback with learning targets, success criteria, and this idea of... Um, um, self-assessment and peer assessment protocol. So if there's anything that, that's an entire chapter in the book, but if there's anything we want people to take away from it, um, and this idea of grading and assessment and project-based learning is that one, assessment and grading aren't the same, right? But two, um, this idea of using self-assessment and peer assessment protocols can really shift the way your classroom is run. Because ideally you want students to be able to self-assess and peer assess uh, their work and their projects and, and uh, protocols really help to facilitate that. Awesome, great feedback there. You know, one of the things that I love that you address is the role of direct instruction. Cause I think sometimes people have this idea of just like, okay, whatever you wanna go study, go study. Let me know what materials you need and I'm just getting out of the way. And there really is this role for direct instruction. So Aaron, talk to us about in a PBL type of environment, what is the role of direct instruction? Yeah, that was, I, when we would get that question, it was like this interesting, like, aha moment for, for, at least for me, I think for Ross too, where it was like, I kind of took for granted that, duh, like, obviously I have to like teach the kids stuff. Like they're six, they don't come with, they don't, you know, when I'm doing this with kindergartners, they don't come to me knowing all the things. Um, but I think that when people just to, I think Ross mentioned earlier, when people have initiative fatigue and they're just, or they just get thrown or they get thrown into PD that's three hours long and then nobody follows up with them. And it's like, here's three hours of inquiry professional development, go do it. The part of like, oh yeah, but I'm still teaching gets lost. Um, so there's definitely like three main ways I would say uh, direct instruction occurs. Uh, first, it is proactive, right? So this is the stuff that we know kids just aren't going to come to us knowing. So like if part of what I have to teach kids is the metric system, but I'm going to do it while they are designing a water filtration system, like, okay, so I need to just like 
teach them the metric system. What are the bare minimum of what they need to know? Like, I'm going to have to show them that part. Then there are reactive lessons. So that's like, oh, you know, crud. I assumed that they were going to know how to do this and they don't. Or, wow, this is a question that all the groups are having. They're not uncovering this information like I thought they were going to. I'm going to pull the group back together and I'm going to teach them this part. Um, and then there's like learning detours, right? So like there's this kid, a kid came up with this really interesting question and, or this really interesting idea. And we're going to kind of go off on this detour with them for a little bit because it's important and it matters to them. And I just want to make sure that they see the value in that. Um, so those are ways that direct instruction happens. And then there's sort of like, this also thought process, the difference between it being a mini lesson or something that's small, short and targeted versus an extended lesson. So like a mini lesson is truly like, this is where you have things that you must say to kids. And the way, and the reason we call them mini lessons um, is just because if it's something that you just need to say, like it is information that needs to be delivered because sometimes that just has to happen. It should truly be mini. Like we know kids' attention spans, we know the brain science, like they're listening to you for maybe 10 minutes. So like, don't push it. Um, extended lessons are where this is something that's related to the bigger project that we're doing, but it's gonna take a little bit longer. So those extended lessons are not lectures. Those extended lessons are, you know, they're a dialogue with an outside professional. Perhaps it's a demo on how to use a database. Um, so they are lessons that might take longer, but definitely should not be lecture based. Um, so that's sort of how direct instruction unfolds during uh, project based learning. Awesome. Thank you for sharing that. Ross, I want to go back to you for one more question, and then we're going to start to wrap it up here. One of the things I see you share out on social media a lot is the connection as well between inquiry and project based learning. So where's the synergy there? What's that look like? By the way, Aaron's answer was great. I have to say that. that just you were smirking. a good co-author. Like, co smirking because I'm forgetting something. No, like, I, <laughs> I was smiling because it it took us. It honestly, like, it to to take something it very abstract like that, like direct instruction during PBL, and to communicate it in a way that's concrete. It's a lot of work. So well done. Um, <laughs> so um, with inquiry, I think you know. I think when we talk about initiatives, like Aaron mentioned initiative fatigue, and we think about what we're tackling in districts, it's a lot of times it's a buzzword bingo, right? And a lot of times it turns into, hey, like, we just really want this bumper sticker that says our school or district is doing this. So we could push it out on social media or so we could talk about it at a board meeting. And I think if we're going to tackle this work on a deeper level, we have to, for ourselves, for our teachers, educators, students, we have to know how they all really connect to one another um, in order to promote student-centered learning. And really that's all this really is, whether it's genius hour, personalized learning, which can mean a million things, by the way, um, ma maker spaces, project-based learning, inquiry-based learning, it's all really student-centered learning. So we look at, we look at as inquiry-based learning um, or inquiry as students learning through investigation and exploration. That's really what it is, right? Um, there's this idea of like direct instruction, then there's this idea of really students learning and, and kind of like, um, like uncovering, you know, the information through some type of investigation or exploration. Um, that could happen through the course of a lesson, it could happen through the course of an activity, a performance task, whatever it might be. But th the idea is that inquiry based learning could be applied to anything, you know, it could be could be applied to, to even even like Aaron was talking about mini lessons before. Um, even there could even be a, a workshop mini lesson during reading and writing workshop that's to an extent inquiry based. Mm -hmm. When you have inquiry and it's that idea of investigation and exploration and it spans across an entire instructional unit, then you have project based learning. So really a lot of times people say, um, like, like, how do you define project based learning, right? And I think really at its core, it's, it's, a, um, it's an inquiry-based unit, an instructional unit um, where students learn through investigation and exploration. And then of course, like sometimes you get into all these things like, oh, but it needs to be authentic. Students need to solve a real world problem. And then I think it starts to really muddy the water a little bit because it's like authentic can mean different things, 
right? And I think also when you talk about like breaking down the walls of your classrooms and you need to have an outside expert, or it's not PBO. One, then we're taking an elitist approach, which tends to turn people off. But two, it's not really realistic for, for educators and teachers to do that all the time. So people look at that and, and it, sometimes it brings about, about, it brings about too much fear. And then it's like, then we just go back to what we were doing before. So really um, inquiry is a building block that contributes to project-based learning when it spreads across an entire unit. And because of that inquiry is a nice entry point into project-based learning, get used to students being at the center of the learning through project, um, through activities, through lessons. And then once you're comfortable there, transition to entire units through project-based learning. Great stuff. So, so our time is really tight, but I want to do kind of one in one here, 30 seconds or less each. Give me an entry point. If I'm a teacher, if I'm a principal and I'm like, all right, you've sold me. I like this instructional model. I want to be student centered, but I'm scared of where to begin. Aaron, give me one entry point. If I'm a teacher or principal thoughts. Um, I think that probably I don't know. I feel like don't, I'm don't take mine. Do not take mine. I know I'm trying to read Ross's face and I don't know. <laughs> I don't know which one he's going to say. Um, so I guess the, the best thing that I the best experiences that I have seen related to project based learning is when um, like maybe people start with something like genius hour. Was that what you were going to say? Nope. No, swing and a miss. No, okay, that's good. good. I mean, um, so not, not I really think a, miss, a lot but, of people you know. like to start with something like Genius Hour because they feel like that's something that's not completely related to my standards, and it's okay if like it's a little bit like off of what I'm supposed to teach. Um, and what the best experiences that I have seen come out of Genius Hour is when people start with a problem. So when we, our sixth grade team did this amazing job rolling Genius Hour out to um, their students and it just, a lot of kids baked cupcakes and there wasn't a lot of like, I really like to bake. So I'm going to choose cupcakes as my topic. And then we just had a lot of kids bake cupcakes, but then the next year they flipped it and they said, you have to solve some kind of problem. So you can, you love to bake. That's great. But now solve a problem related to baking. Mm -hmm. um, so it was like, oh, I want to bake cupcakes, but I don't have I won't pretend that I know anything about kitchen stuff. So like, I don't have this ingredient. And then like, okay, so what do you do to solve this problem about not having this ingredient and do the cupcakes still taste the same? So like, that is a good way to level that up and a awesome. great entry point for people. Ross, give us an entry point. Yeah. So, um, so I wasn't going to do genius hour, although genius hour is impactful because uh, can I say, I'm going to say one thing about what Aaron said too. Um, <laughs> So, so, but I think when you're doing project-based learning, a big question is how do you connect to the standards? And sometimes it's like, that, that's tough, um, even for us. So when you're saying when you're doing Genius Hour, it doesn't necessarily have to connect to the content standards. So it's more open-ended. It's like one of those things where it's high ceiling, low floor. Um, right, Aaron? Is that okay? I love it. No problem. Um, I'll say self-assessment. I think self-assessment is a huge one. I think it's important. Oh, a lot of times when we look at um, initiatives and practices, we look at them in isolation, like whether we're tackling Common Core Math or NGSS, and I think it's important, and then we don't make connections between them, right? And I think it's important to look at these, these practices that, um, you know, as, as John Hattie would say, like huge effect size, big bang for your buck, um, that transcends subject areas. So really hammering home the, um, these practices that you're going to be able to leverage regardless of what you're teaching and regardless of what students are learning. And I think self-assessment is huge. And I, and I touched upon it when I, I answered that assessment and grading question. And you could take this in so many ways. But basically, the, the, the components of self-assessment, and I touched upon this before, but I'll expand upon it a little bit real quickly. Learning targets, which is a student-friendly standard, right? Not, not an objective. We call it a, an objective is for the teacher. A learning target is for the student. Um, success criteria. What does it look like when a student is, has successfully hit that target? And then feedback, and that could be teacher feedback, student feedback, or self-feedback. And then you have your protocols, which I mentioned before, which should be your self-assessment uh, protocols, which, I mean, we have them in the book. We have them on our website, realpbl.com. You could Google them, whatever. Um, but that's basically giving, turning, taking self-assessment and turning it into an event. So rather, yes, students are going to self-assess as they engage in their learning. 
but you want them to also, you also want to give them the time and space to engage in self-assessment without the pressures of having to move forward um, with the project. And protocols will help to do that. As they engage, engage in more protocols, you might start by saying, here, I want you to use these protocols. As you develop more of that gradual release in student agency, students could choose and even create protocols of their own. But those are the big four components I think of self-assessment, learn and target self-criteria, feedback, and, and protocols. And I, I think students as young as kindergarten could do that. And it's something, like I said, that transcends subject areas. And I think it's something that's huge and a non-negotiable student agency um, at any grade level throughout education. Yeah, I appreciate the practical lens that you both bring to this podcast, to the book, but the way we talk about ways that we can actually do it. There's so much out there that's theoretical or 50,000 foot view and just the, the continuous practical examples and tackling those real challenges that you see as you're out there speaking, consulting, working in this different areas, working with school leaders. So final question for each of you, and in all fairness, Ross, I'll start with you on this one. Sure. Let's step out of the PBL conversation a little bit to just being school leaders. Here we are. It's been a year in. School leaders are exhausted. There's fear. There's uncertainty. There's continuous change. We continue to look forward. We hope to see some light at the end of the tunnel. We, we named this podcast a year ago, leading through unprecedented times. And a year later, here we still are. So I'm going to ask each of you to give me just one piece of advice. Talk to your school and district leaders across the country, your colleagues, here we are a year later, continuing to move forward this year. Give us one piece of advice, no matter where they find themselves on any sort of continuum, one piece of advice for a school leader and district leader across the country. Ross, start us off. What do you have? Yeah. Um, have one-on-one -on -one conversations with your people. And I, and I tweeted this out the other day. You know, if you're not doing, if you're not having, if you're an administrator, you're not having one-on-one -on -one conversations with your people, um, you're doing it wrong. And I think, Tell them actually somebody from your old district uh, responded to it. Um, but I think I and like, what are those for? And and really, it's this idea that you're you're listening. You're 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 listening. Um, the whole idea of Stephen Covey seeking to understand. I hear you. I see you. Um, I know what you're going through, uh, which is tough because sometimes we have to take care. We're trying to take care of other people. When to be honest, like I can barely take care of myself. Um, it's tough. Like it is. It is tough. Um, but really just not, not like, not this idea. A lot of times we sit down with people as administrators because we want something from somebody, you know, we want them to do the initiative. We want them to, you know, make sure they teach in a certain way. We want them to pick their kids up from lunch on time, but just this idea of just sitting with them and not even just, and just being there for them and just listening to them. And I'll say, I'm, I'm going to name drop because I haven't name dropped yet. Um, I, I have the, I have the privilege of working with um, a couple of administrators who are tremendous at that. One of them, you know, very well, uh, Tony, Dr. Tony Sinanis, who, who I'm just, you know, who's one of my mentors, he works in my district. And also Tanya Wilson, um, who's the principal at the school I'm at, Roaring Brook School in Chappaqua. And just two people that model that in spades. And I hope I model that. Um, hopefully none of my teachers are listening to this and saying, Ross, like you don't do that. What, what are you You're talking lying. about? Um, but, but I, I think it's just, I think it's just so important. Um, if we want to really see people, not just as professionals, but as people. Awesome. Aaron, piece of advice. Yeah. I think that I would sort of like build on that. So totally agree. And I think that we need to be real. Right. So like the reality is that we are all living through a shared trauma. And if we try to diminish that or minimize it and just really lean on the whole like bootstrap approach to leadership, like pull up your bootstraps, then we aren't doing what's right by our people. Like we need to sure at the end of the day, do we need to like show up <laughs> and do it? Yeah, we do. But we don't need to pretend like it's all sunshine and rainbows along the way. Like we can we can live the, the real talk too. That's Ross Cooper and Aaron Murphy, everybody. The book is Project-Based Learning, Real Questions, Real Answers, How to Unpack PBL and Inquiry. Both of you, thank you for the work that you're doing. Thank you for the conversations that you're exploring and pushing. Appreciate you both. Thank you for your time today. Thanks for having us. Thanks, Tom.